In this unit, we are going to focus on fluid and electrolyte balance in the body. Many times throughout this chapter, I will make reference to different portions of the kidney where many of these processes occur. I realize we have not talked about the kidney yet, but hopefully once we do and go through the kidney in the next unit, and you come back to review this unit, you will be able to make the connections. Now, before we get into different uh, balances in the body, we need to talk about the importance of water. And this is the key behind all of these different balances. Water makes up 99% of the fluid outside of our cells. This is known as the extracellular fluid. Water is also an essential ingredient of the cytosome. This is known as the intracellular fluid, intra within the cells. Water is important because all cellular operations rely on water as a diffusion medium for gases, nutrients, and waste products. The body must maintain normal volume and composition of these fluids of both the ECF and the ICF. For example, if water levels drop too low, proteins can become denatured. Remember, enzymes are proteins, and if they become denatured, they will stop functioning and our cells could die. Looking at this picture describes the two compartments. Intracellular fluid, this makes up about 20 to 1 to 22 total liters of water in our body. Extracellular fluid is comprised of the interstitial fluid, this is the fluid that bathes our cells, and the water in plasma, as well as water in other areas. We will be looking at these. First, we briefly talk about the different types of balance we're going to discuss in this chapter. First being fluid balance. There is a daily fluid balance involves a daily balance between the amount of water gained and the amount of water lost to the environment. The digestive system is the primary source of water gains. This is through the food we eat as well as, th as things that we drink. We also gain a small amount of water from metabolic activities. The urinary system is the primary route for water loss from the body. We also lose water through feces, sweating, and breathing. We will also be looking at electrolyte balance. Electrolytes are ions that are released through the dissociation of different inorganic compounds. They are named as such, i.e. called electrolytes, because they have the ability to conduct an electrical current in solution. With electrolyte balance, as with water balance, there is a state where gains and losses of all electrolytes are equal. This primarily involves balancing the rate of absorption of these electrolytes across the digestive tract and the rate of loss of these electrolytes through the kidneys and through our sweat glands. The third balance we will look at is acid-base balance. This, is the ba this balances the production of and loss of hydrogen ions. Free hydrogen ions are what determine the pH. The body is constantly generating acids during normal metabolism. Uh, when we exercise, our muscles produce lactic acid. When we digest and metabolize proteins, our body produces sulfuric acid and phosphoric acid. These are strong acids, and they're constantly a source of these free hydrogen ions, and we need a way to balance this. The kidneys help. They secrete hydrogen ions into the urine so they will be lost from the body. The kidneys also generate buffers that will enter the bloodstream, and this occurs in the distal convoluted tubule as well as the collecting system of the kidney. The lungs also help in acid-base balance. The, the lungs will affect the pH balance through the elimination of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is involved in the formation of carbonic acid. So when we blow off or exhale CO2, we prevent the formation of this acid. All right, we're going to start with fluid balance first. And again, coming back to the importance of water. 60% of the male body is water, whereas about 50% of the female body is comprised of water. The difference between the two is due to the fact that females tend to have more adipose tissue and males have more muscle tissue, and this accounts for the differences in, uh, in water. 
Water exchange between the ICF and the ECF occurs across the plasma membrane, our cell membrane. That is the main membrane that separates these two major fluid compartments. This occurs via osmosis, diffusion, and carrier-mediated transport. Let's come back to these fluid compartments again, especially the ECF. What are the major subdivisions here in our ECF? The interstitial fluid is the main one. This is the fluid around or that bathes our cells, the around our peripheral tissues. And then the other major subdivision is the water that is contained in plasma of our circulating blood. But then we have this other group up here. This is other sources of water. This includes the water in lymph as well as perilymph and endolymph. Perilymph, endolymph, these are the fluids found in our inner ear. It involves water in the cerebral spinal fluid, in the synovial fluid of our joints, in the serous fluid. This is the small amount of fluid between your pleural, pericardial, and peritoneal membranes. And it also includes the aqueous humor that is found in your eye. The ECF and the ICF are called fluid compartments because they behave as distinct entities. Remember, they are separated by the plasma membrane, and they are also separated by active transport. This will allow, the, these two features will allow the cells to maintain an internal environment with a composition that differs from their surroundings. So what components, what electrolytes, what materials we see inside of the cell can be very different from the extracellular fluid or the environment around our cells. So let's revisit the function of our cell membrane. We did talk about this last semester. The plasma membrane, remember, is selectively permeable. It is the guard. It decides what can enter and what can leave our cells. Ions can enter or leave via specific membrane channels. And again, we looked at a lot of these last semester. Carrier mechanisms will move specific ions in and out of the cell. Now, when we look at the composition inside of our cell versus the composition outside, we said that they can be very different from each other. However, the osmotic or the solute concentration of the ICF and ECF are identical to each other. Remember, the solute concentration, the absolute number of particles inside of our cell versus outside of our cell are equal to each other. The absolute number of particles. However, what those particles are can be very different from each other. For example, in the ECF, you're going to find a very high concentration of sodium ions, chloride ions, and bicarb. In the ICF, you find a very high concentration of potassium, magnesium, phosphorus, and proteins. So the composition can differ as long as the absolute particle concentration remains the same. Remember osmosis. Osmosis is the movement of water when the osmotic concentration or the particle concentration differs. This is very important in our cells to maintain this equal concentration of particles. If these particles are not equal, as we're going to see in just a moment, water will move from one side of the membrane to the other, and this can upset fluid balance. We're going to revisit a couple of hormones. I know we've talked about these hormones a lot through the semester, but once again, because they all three of these have a very important effect on both fluid and electrolyte balance in the body. These include antidiuretic hormone, aldosterone, and the natriuretic peptides. Antidiuretic hormone, if you remember, will stimulate water conservation at the kidneys. In other words, cause the kidneys to hold on to water and not dump it in the urine. ADH will also stimulate your thirst center. We have osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus that are constantly monitoring the osmotic concentration of the extracellular fluid, i.e. how many particles are present in the extracellular fluid.
If these receptors detect an increase in the particle concentration, they will result in the secretion of ADH from the posterior pituitary. Aldosterone is another important hormone. This is secreted by the suprarenal cortex or the adrenal cortex in response to, to either a rise in potassium or a loss of sodium levels in the blood. So if the concentration of these two materials are not normal in the blood, it will also be released in response to activation of the renin angiotensin system. What aldosterone does is it will determine the rate of sodium absorption and potassium loss along the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting system of the kidney. High aldosterone plasma concentration will cause the kidney to conserve sodium ions and dump potassium in the urine. The last one is natriuretic peptides. ANP is released by our cardiac muscle cells in response to abnormal stretching of the heart wall. Abnormal stretching would indicate that there's more blood volume than normal going through the heart. More volume means the heart muscle has to stretch more to accommodate it. This will stimulate the release of AMP. AMP acts to reduce your thirst so you are not thirsty and it blocks the release of ADH and aldosterone. AMP will also cause diuresis, causing the kidneys to dump water. The net effect is to lower your blood pressure and to lower your plasma volume. All right, so let's look at this concept of fluid movement within the ECF. We have already talked about this. The main movement in the ECF is between the plasma and the interstitial fluid. And this occurs across the capillary membrane. We talked about this back in the blood vessel chapter. This movement across our capillary membrane involves two opposing forces. First force is hydrostatic pressure or blood pressure. This is the pressure that pushes water out of the plasma and into the interstitial fluid. Remember, this occurs at the beginning of our capillary beds. The opposing force is colloid osmotic pressure. This is the pressure that draws water out of the interstitial fluid and puts it back into either the plasma or the lymph vessels. And again, this uh, movement occurs primarily at the end of our capillary bed. This interaction between these two opposing forces will result in the continuous filtration of fluid from the capillaries into the interstitial uh, fluid. So again, we looked at these back in the blood vessel chapter. Edema refers to the movement of abnormal amounts of water from the plasma into the interstitial fluid. Now, interstitial fluid begins to build up and it will not be properly drained by the limb system. This could result from either an increase in blood pressure in the capillaries, driving more water out into the tissues, or a decrease in the colloid osmotic pressure that prevents water from being taken back into the blood vessels or the lymph system. Let's look at fluid losses and gains. The body loses roughly 2,500 milliliters of water every day. The main loss <coughs> excuse me, is through urine. We also lose small amounts of water through feces, and we lose an awful lot of water through what is known as insensible perspiration. Insensible pers perspiration, this is the gradual movement of water across the epithelial of the skin. This is not sweating. This is evaporation, just the gradual loss of water across the skin. And it also involves a loss of water through the respiratory tract. Every time we exhale, there is, we are losing water. This is what, uh, on a cold day, you can see your breath. That is the water vapor we are losing when we breathe. Fever can also increase water losses. And then there is sensible perspiration. This is sweating. Sensible perspiration can vary depending on what our activities are, and it could result in significant water loss. 
the maximum rate of uh, sweating is a loss of four liters per hour. And this is during very, very intense uh, exercise. Fluid gains, well, if we lose 2,500 liters, we better gain 2,500 liters throughout the day. The main sources of water would be through eating and drinking. We also will gain small amounts of water through metabolic activities. This is the water that is generated at the end of the electron transport system. Dehydration will develop when water loss is greater than gains. If water is lost, but electrolytes are retained. Okay? You're losing water, but not electrolytes. The electrolytes are staying behind. What will happen is your solute concentration in your ECF will rise. It will appear you've lost water around those solutes. They will now appear to be more concentrated. So now you have more particles in the ECF compared to the ICF. This is going to cause water to move via osmosis. Water will move from the ICF into the ECF in an attempt to dilute those particles out. As a result, the cells will start to dry out because they are losing water. When this happens, there will be various homeostatic responses that occur in the body. One will be at the, the physiological level, physiological mechanisms. This will involve the secretion of, of ADH as well as renin-angiotensin system. There will also be various behavioral changes. You will become thirsty and this will help to increase your fluid intake. What could cause dehydration? Severe sweating exercising in hot weather resulting in very severe sweating, a decrease in fluid consumption for whatever reason, or severe vomiting and diarrhea. The opposite is overhydration. If water is gained but electrolytes are not, so now you have an excess water gain, but the, the electrolytes have stayed the same. Now the volume of the ECF is going to increase, and this is going to make it more dilute. So now the ICF has more particles compared to the ECF. Water will move from the ECF into the ICF, and this can cause our cells to swell up. This could be due to the in ingestion of large volumes of water or an infusion into the blood. It could also be due to an inability to eliminate excess water in the urine, and this water begins to build up in the body. This could be due to chronic renal failure, heart failure, or cirrhosis. Now we're going to shift into electrolyte balance. This balance requires the rates of gain and loss of each electrolyte in the body to be equal. As we've just seen with water, electrolyte concentration directly affects water balance, so the two go hand in hand. The concentration of an individual electrolytes will have an effect on cell functions. Abnormal amounts of sodium will have an effect on your neurons, and abnormal amounts of either calcium or potassium could have adverse effects on your cardiac muscle. The first electrolyte to look at is sodium. Sodium provides 90% of the solute concentration of our ECF. Look at how much sodium is in the ECF. And there is significantly, right up here, significantly less in the ICF. Sodium ion uptake occurs across the digestive epithelium. If gains exceed losses, so you're gaining more sodium than you need, this is going to cause your total ECF content to rise. You're going to have more particles in the ECF. Now your ECF has a higher solute concentration, particle concentration. This will cause water to move into the ECF in an attempt to dilute this out, and as a result, your blood volume will increase. Sodium ion excretion occurs in the urine and through perspiration. If losses exceed the gains, now the amount of sodium in the ECF declines. Now the ECF will appear to be very dilute and have an excess amount of water. 
Water will leave the ECF and your blood volume will decrease. So blood volume is linked to sodium concentration. Your blood volume can increase due to increased levels of sodium. How do we monitor blood volume? It's monitored indirectly through blood pressure. We have baroreceptors located in the carotid sinus, aortic sinus, and in our right atrium. These are designed to detect stretching of these areas. They would stretch because of an increased volume going through these areas. So a rise in blood volume will end up elevating blood pressure and this will stimulate the baroreceptors. When the baroreceptors are stimulated, this will result in the release of the natriuretic peptides, both AMP and BMP. You will also have a reduction in thirst and it will block the secretion of ADH and aldosterone. Remember, somebody has high blood pressure. One is what is one of the first things that you like to try before they start prescribing medication. Let's cut the salt out of the diet. If you can decrease the sodium intake to the body, this can help decrease volume. Our next electrolyte is potassium. This is the dominant cation in your ICF. Cells will actually expend energy to recover potassium ions that have diffused into the ECF. Remember that sodium-potassium pump. Potassium is very rare in the ECF. Potassium loss is primarily through the urine. This is regulated by the activities of ion pumps along the distal portion of your nephron in the collecting system. It is also regulated uh, through sodium from the tubular fluid being exchanged for potassium in the peritubular fluid. Aldosterone levels will also have an effect. Aldosterone affects the amount of potassium lost in the urine. Ion pumps will reabsorb sodium from the filtrate in exchange for potassium from the peritubular fluid whenever aldosterone is around. High potassium plasma concentrations will stimulate aldosterone secretion so that some of this excess potassium will be dumped into the urine. Next is calcium. When you look at the fluids, it's just a little green line here. Doesn't appear to be much, and right here, doesn't appear to be much at all. And yet, calcium is the most abundant mineral of the body. Calcium is not found in abundance in our fluids. 99% of all calcium in the body is found in the skeleton. So you don't, you're not going to see an excess in either the ECF or the ICF. However, calcium concentrations are very important. Calcium absorption occurs at the digestive tract, as well as reabsorption along the distal convoluted tubule of the kidney. Calcium absorption is stimulated by parathyroid hormone and calcitriol. Hyperparathyroidism or certain cancers, such as breast, lung, kidney, and bone marrow cancers, can cause hypercalcemia. This is uh, higher than normal levels of calcium in the blood. Also, a, an excess of calcium supplements or an excess of vitamin D can cause this condition as well. Calcium loss occurs in the bile, urine, or feces. This usually is only about 0.03% of the calcium reserves that are typically seen in the skeleton, so we don't lose a whole lot of calcium. Chronic renal failure and hypoparathyroidism may cause a hypocalcemia. In other words, too low to causing an excess of calcium loss, resulting in levels being lower than normal. Magnesium is our next one. Magnesium is primarily seen in the ICF. Magnesium is important because it is a, acts as a cofactor for many enzymatic reactions. Remember, a cofactor is something that works with the enzyme. If that cofactor isn't present, the enzyme will not be able to function. Magnesium is also an important structural component of the bone. About 60% of all the magnesium in the body will be found in the skeleton. Next is phosphate. Okay. 
and we see this over here in the ICF. Phosphate is required for bone mineralization. In the ICF, it is required for the formation of high energy compounds, for the activation of enzymes, and for the synthesis of nucleic acids. Remember, ICF is the fluid inside of our cells. This is where the cell will be making ATP, making nucleic acids, etc. So it makes sense that phosphates would be very high here. And then our last electrolyte is chloride, the chloride ions. This is the most abundant anion in the ECF. You see it here. Now before I go further, I have used two terms, anion versus cation. I want to make sure you know the difference. An anion, such as chloride ions, anion means they carry a negative charge. So the two we've talked about that are anions are the chloride ion and the phosphate ion. A cation carries a positive charge. All of the other electrolytes we've talked about are cations because they carry a positive charge. All right, going back to chloride ions. This is, again, the most abundant uh, anion in the ECF. In the ICF, very, very low amounts of chloride ion. Most chloride comes from absorption across the G GI tract in combination with sodium, hence sodium chloride. When we absorb sodium, we also absorb the chloride ion. The last balance in the body to discuss is acid-base balance. This refers to the pH of body fluids, and it will depend on the concentration of dissolved acids, bases, and salts. Some basic terms to understand first. Acidosis is a physiological state resulting from an abnormally low plasma pH. Alkalosis is a physiological state resulting from an abnormally high plasma pH. Both of these conditions will have an effect on all body systems, especially the nervous system and the cardiovascular system. Both of these conditions are extremely dangerous for the body. Acidosis tends to be more common because of all of the acids that are produced during normal cellular activities. Now, just to give you an idea, the normal pH of our plasma is 7.4. A person is considered to be suffering from acidosis if the pH drops to 7, below 7.35. That is not a big difference, but could be very dangerous to the body. Alkalosis occurs if the pH goes above 7.45. Again, not a big difference, but still potentially dangerous to the body. Now, to understand acid-base, one important material we need to understand is the role of carbon dioxide. Remember, carbon dioxide is continually being produced in our tissues through the process of cellular respiration, and this has to be eliminated from the body. But what happens is carbon dioxide builds up. It will react with water to form carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is known as a volatile acid because it can leave sol the solution and enter into the atmosphere. And this is what happens with it at the level of the lungs. In our ECF, at a normal pH of 7.4, there will be an equilibrium state. And it's diagrammed here that carbonic acid dissociates into free hydrogen ions and free bicarb ions. So to maintain a pH of 7.4, there is a certain level of CO2 that will create this balance and create the free hydrogen ions, causing a pH of 7.4. We get rid of carbon dioxide at the lungs. When blood go, uh, uh, reaches or approaches the lung, this carbonic acid will break down into carbon dioxide in water instead, and we blow off this uh, carbon dioxide. So this is one way that uh, the body can eliminate excess carbon dioxide. Because if carbon dioxide builds up, we will create too much of the carbonic acid, and this can shift the equilibrium so that we have too many hydrogen ions, and this can lower the pH. Right? And so as the levels of CO2 rise, we will create more carbonic acid. This will lower the pH, 
and this could result in an acidosis. The opposite, if we don't have enough CO2, okay, if we're, say, hyperventilating, blowing off too much CO2, we don't have enough in the body to maintain this equilibrium. This will cause the pH to rise, and this can result in alkalosis. Remember, hydrogen ions are what free hydrogen ions are what determine the pH. The more free hydrogen ions we have, the lower and more acidic the pH will be. Hydrogen ions are gained at the digestive tract through the foods we eat and also through cellular metabolic activities. We've talked about uh, this. Lactic acid through uh, the working of our muscles, sulfuric and phosphoric acid through the breakdown of proteins. Hydrogen ions can be eliminated at the level of the kidney in our urine. So when there are excess hydrogen ions, the kidneys help by dumping some of these into the urine. They can also be eliminated at the lungs, and this is done by blowing off carbon dioxide. If we eliminate carbon dioxide, we eliminate the ability to make carbonic acid. Acids or free hydrogen ions must be neutralized in order to avoid tissue damage. Acids produced in normal metabolic activities will be temporarily neutralized by buffers in our body fluids. So what's a buffer? A buffer are dissolved compounds that help to stabilize the pH. They do this by either providing or removing free hydrogen ions. Buffers are either a weak acid or a weak base. A weak acid will negate a basic condition because they can donate hydrogen ions. A weak base will negate an acidic condition because they have the ability to absorb free hydrogen ions. There are three main buffer systems in the body. We have the protein buffer system. This helps to regulate the pH in both the ECF and the ICF. They interact extensively with each other as well as with the other two buffering systems. The carbonic acid bicarb buffer. This is the most important buffering system in the ECF. And lastly, the phosphate buffering system. This buffers the pH of the ICF as well as helps with the pH of the urine. How do we maintain this acid-base balance? How do we maintain a normal pH of around 7.4? This requires balancing the number of hydrogen ions gained with those that are lost. So it involves the coordinated action of these buffering systems with the respiratory system and with various renal mechanisms. These help uh, to support the buffering systems by either secreting or absorbing hydrogen ions, controlling the excretion of acids and bases, and helping to generate additional buffers. So this is support of the buffering system. Occurs by either secreting or absorbing hydrogen ions, controlling how many acids or base are excreted, and trying to generate additional buffers to help. Let's first look at how the respiratory system helps to compensate to maintain this balance of pH. Whenever there's a change in CO2 levels, there will be a change in your respiratory rate. So this will help it to stabilize the pH of the ECF. This will be done by either exhaling the excess carbon dioxide or seeing a decrease in your respiration rate to conserve CO2. The lungs, or this respiratory compensation, occurs whenever the body pH moves outside of the normal limits. It will directly have an effect on the carbonic acid bicarb buffering system because of the CO2. So in this picture, we're looking at how the lungs, and well also the kidneys, we'll come back to them in a moment, but right now the lungs, how do they compensate in response to acidosis? Acidosis means we have an excess hydrogen ions. One way, one source of those hydrogen ions would be from the carbonic acid bicarb uh, equilibrium equation. Well, this is, equation is out of balance. How can we eliminate hydrogen ions? We can prevent the formation of this carb carbonic acid. How do we do that? 
get rid of some CO2. So what you will see when uh, in response to acidosis or decline in the pH, your respiratory rate will increase. So you'll have an increased respiratory rate, blow off that, uh, some of that excess CO2. The more CO2 you get rid of, okay, the less carbonic acid you will form, and this will lower the amount of free hydrogen ions. The opposite ha happens in uh, response to alkalosis. Now you don't have enough hydrogen ions. How can we get more? We could create more carbonic acid to dissociate here. How can we get more carbonic acid? Okay. We can hold on to some CO2. So we hold, the respiratory rate will decrease. As our respiratory rate lowers, we are blowing off or exhaling less carbon dioxide. CO2 will build up in the plasma, creating more acid that will dissociate, and this will balance the pH, uh, you know, lower the pH, and correct for this alkalosis. Now, how do the kidneys help us to compensate? There will be a change in the rate of hydrogen ion and bicarb secretion or reabsorption by the kidneys in response to changes in the pH of the plasma. The body normally generates enough organic and fixed acids each day to add a lot of hydrogen ions to that extracellular fluid. So the kidney helps by secreting many of these. So how do the kidneys help the lungs? We've already looked at this picture in relation to the lungs. We're back at acidosis again. We have too many hydrogen ions. The kidneys help by dumping some of these hydrogen ions into the urine. The kidneys can also help by generating some of this bicarb to buffer some of those excess hydrogen ions. In a state of alkalosis, you will see the opposite. The kidneys will secrete some of this excess bicarb, and they will help to generate uh, hydrogen ions to put back into the plasma. Now, the detection of acidosis or alkalosis in a patient will include both blood tests for pH, for the concentration of CO2, as well as bicarb levels in the blood. This will classify the condition as either acidosis or alkalosis based on the result. Then each of these conditions will be further classified as either a respiratory condition or a metabolic condition. What this means is there is respiratory acidosis, respiratory alkalosis, metabolic acidosis, and metabolic alkalosis. What designates it as being a respiratory condition, respiratory will result from some mismatch between the amount of CO2 generated in the tissues and the ability to release that CO2 in the lungs. For example, somebody who has emphysema or fibrosis in the lungs would have a very difficult time eliminating carbon dioxide, and a hard time exhaling. CO2 will build up in the lungs, and this will create an acidosis. Because it is the lungs at fault, it would be further classified as respiratory acidosis. Metabolic states are caused by the generation of organic acids that will affect the concentration of bicarb in the ECF.